have a special musical number by our ward choir, following which we'll have the opportunity to hear from Sister Sarah Packard, and we'll have another special musical number by Sister Musette Alvis, and then President Bernard Packard, a member of the Houston, Texas East Mission Presidency, will be our concluding speaker. Our closing hymn will be on page 199, uh, following which Brother Hal LaCrae will give the benediction. to be here this Easter morning when this is the joyous morning of the year as far as I'm concerned because it is the day that brings us hope of a resurrection. A day that brings us hope of the day that we can be united with those that we got since the previous season. Uh, so it is a glorious among 
all day. Uh, because it is the reason that we have hope to go on, the reason that we can uh, strive to go forward to be better people, and for more than no resurrection, what use would it we would feel to strive for um, happiness and betterment and all the things that we strive for. Uh, I pray quite fervently about this assignment because I consider it a, a serious assignment on this Easter day because it's such a reverent day and a special day. And um, uh, I prayed earnestly about what message I should bring. And I, I asked the Lord, and it, it didn't come easy. And I searched the scriptures, and I searched my incense, and I searched, and I still had a hard time coming with a clear understanding about what the Lord was having to communicate. And finally, the answer did come. And it was uh, it's almost a sinner. Not audible, but yet clear in my mind. And it was just tell them that, that I love them. So that's what I'm going to do. It's to remind you and me of how much the Savior really does love us. First of all, I'd like to read you a poem that was written by my son Marshall while he was on his mission. And uh, as he was contemplating the great uh, mission of our son Jesus, of the Lord's son, God's son, Jesus Christ, and uh, the irony that came in his life as he uh, suffered for us. And I'd like to read that to you. <clears throat> the Lord of Lords was born in the stable, God's only begotten son, a virgin conceived. The people believed, for he was the chosen one. The Son of Man, the Son of God, he grew greater than us all. But through time man forgot and knew him not, the Savior of Adam's fall. He lived a perfect life all his days he humbly served. Some were receptive, but most have rejected their God, his love, his word. He spat upon the ground and with clay healed the blind to see. Others spat on him, the Savior of sin. They were the blind who couldn't see. He's loved by us. He loves us all. But to his followers' dismay, Judas was bold and kissed him for gold, not love. Our Lord was betrayed. The King of Kings, our eternal judge, was judged by a king of the world. His life was then handed to the crowd that demanded so his plan could then be unfurled. The teacher of modesty was stripped and scourged beaten for me and for you. So d- despite the pain given him, he said, Father, forgive him, for they know not what they do. He died for the men who cried, crucify him. I wonder what went through his mind. He died for the men who were nailing him in. That's the love I hope to find. The Christ was crucified and lifted up upon the cross by men so we may arise to stand by his side before the Father of men. He created this beautiful world. If only they could have known, they couldn't understand. He was more than a man and rejected him their own. He created the earth and its elements. Thus the coins that bought this man. For no man he hated. The cross he created and the nails that were driven in his hands. With all the terrible pain on the cross in Gethsemane, he suffered more. Secluded and humble, a god now trembled knelt trembling and bled from every pore. Now some take the cross and worship it. We all sorrow for his death. I sorrow his strife, but I worship his life and his spirit to fill my breath. For through his life and resurrection, I know we'll live again. Someday he will come, the chosen one, and bring the eternal life of man. He lived to die and died to live. His plan is clear and concise. This is why to you I cry. Open your eyes. As I was uh, searching through some old incense and the scriptures, I found a story uh, told by Elder John Lasseter of his travels in the 
state of Monaco, where uh, they were in caravan on some government assignment, and uh, they were following these five black limousines. And then as they approached the top of the hill, he saw that one of the limousines had pulled over. And uh, when they stopped, they discovered that the limousine had injured a little lamb. He said there was a shepherd there, clothed in the long robes of the ancient uh, time, and uh, was talking to the men. He was reminded that the laws of the land required that the, uh, Brother Lassiter was told that the laws of the land required that if you injure a lamb, that you are required to pay a hundred times the value of that lamb were it mature. He said, but the shepherd will not take it. Watch. And sure enough, and he watched the shepherd. He reached down and picked up a little lamb and took stroke in his head and sang the same word over. And he said, uh, what does he say? He said, he's saying uh, his name. He said, a good shepherd really knows each of his lambs by name. And it's my uh, uh, testament that he does know and love us each by name. The Sumerian woman was surprised when the Savior could tell everything that she had ever done in her life and that he was um, very intimately acquainted with her life and everything that she had done, and she was surprised. But it's no wonder he, the creator of us all, is not intimately acquainted with everything that goes on in our lives. It's, uh, we wonder and marvel when we look at all the creations. I just drove through the Smoky Mountains by myself and I put on those amber vision glasses which made everything that was budding green turn greener and, uh, more visible. And I, I marvel at the beauty of the earth and the creations of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. <clears throat> but, and then I realized too that not only this world but many worlds has He, has he created. And this makes me feel almost insignificant. But yet I know as um, Enoch who saw the creations of our Heavenly Father, he said, yet, uh, yet He is there. And he is there for you and me. And his capacity to love and to comprehend and to know us each by name is there. For he is truly the good shepherd. Uh, a story that's always been a favorite of mine. And first we realized that Mr. W. Kimball said, that oh, the Lord is mindful for, of us, but it is uses in the hands of others that he um, perceives our needs and tends to our needs. And uh, one of my very favorite stories that uh, Papa Monson has told about his life is a story that little Crystal met them. You may have heard this story. It's a true story of that little girl from Shreveport, Louisiana, who had cancer and was dying. She, uh, and this is an example of how the Lord moves and intervenes in our lives to service our needs. And he's mindful of her and I'm sure knew her by name. And <clears throat> she and her family prayed that she could go to Salt Lake City to receive a blessing from one of the general authorities. They didn't know any of the general authorities personally, so they brought out a big picture to choose one. And she chose and pointed to Apostle Monson. And uh, as they looked at her condition worsened, and so she wasn't able to make the trip, so she and her child out faith at two years old said, Well, the Lord can just bring him to us. And it just so happened at that time, or about that time, that Papa Monty's conference assignment was changed, but guess where? And he indeed uh, was a Shreveport, Indiana. But the story didn't end there. He got there, and he was approached uh, about giving her a blessing. The time the conference schedules were busy, and there wasn't really a lot of time. Well, she lived far away from the conference where the conference was being held, and she was too sick to come to the building. But nevertheless, the state president kind of apologetically requested that he go and give a blessing. Uh, and uh, <coughs> uh, they, but their request was turned down because of the heavy meeting schedule. And so uh, the family knelt again in prayer, and uh, they were disappointed. 
but they knelt in prayer and asked for a final favor on their behalf and uh, uh, that somehow the blessing would be realized. He said, at the very moment the Metzen family knelt around Tissel's bed, Elder Monson was shuffling his notes, preparing to speak at the concluding portion of the Saturday evening session. However, as he began his move to the pulpit, a voice whispered in near audible tones a brief but very familiar message. Suffer the little children to come up to me and forbid them not for us, such is the kingdom of God. His note became a blur. He attempted to pursue the theme of the meeting as outlined, but the name and the image of this little girl would not leave his mind. Then ever faithful to the precious gift, so that's his, he responded to the spiritual message. He instructed that changes in the next day's conference schedule be made, whatever the cost, the confusion. And then the meeting continued. After a very early Sunday drive over many miles, Elder Monson gave down on a child too ill to rise for two weeks to speak. Her illness was now recommended to sightless. Deeply touched by the scene in the Spirit of the Lord, which was so prevalent, Brother Monson dropped to his knees and took the child's frail hand in his own. So he whispered, I am here. It was a great effort she whispered back. Brother Monson, I just knew he would come. Anyway, uh, that shows how the Lord intervened. He knows us by name. He knows what we're going through. And he doesn't forget us. But we, and we've got to remember that. <laughs> and we don't pass by the things that happen, that all that stuff that happened to Elder Monson was not a coincidence. It was, we must recognize it as intervention from the Lord. Uh, uh, I think that, that there's uh, so many evidences in our just last uh, general conference. We heard the story of the, the Chinese woman who was a little 11 year old Buddhist girl and how the Lord intervened in her life and seemingly insignificant little girl to the missionaries who were teaching her about how the Lord intervened in her life and brought her the gospel in its fullness. It was no accident. And we don't need to pass these things off as accidents. There is, uh, in the little Chinese general authority, there you see a little boy, a little orphan boy. His aunt was, uh, illiterate and carried her, I don't remember he said, on her shoulders, her food to the market every day to, so she could survive and have food to eat. A little Chinese boy. And yet he's, he's rose, risen to be a general authority and prepared to minister to the needs of his people there. And it's no accident that the missionaries found him when he was 18 years old and that he was been able to be tutored and groomed for this important assignment. Um, I think um, to my own family and uh, speaking of Pam's father, who uh, was inspired just from reading a, uh, to go to BYU, never heard of it before. And he and his brother went there, joined the church, and he became a missionary companion to Orrin Hatch, and later a federal judge, and later probably the only uh, man with Romanian blood in him to be a federal judge in the United States and was allowed to go to the country of Romania. And there, uh, somehow I pass upon the man who's in charge of opening that country, uh, that this country, this country will be open to Mormon missionaries if they're like, anything like they did Sam. It's, the Lord prepared that. It's no accident. That's the Lord intervening in our lives. And He's intervening and using Him to intervene in the lives of others in Romania so they can join the church. We've got to recognize his intervention in our lives. We don't think he does. We're going to go to think coming. I've always told my children. Uh, Elder Monson, always, he was a young bishop, early, and he was always concerned with the needs of the widow. Uh, he told the story of Spencer W. Kimball. He said his first acquaintance was Spencer W. Kimball. He called him up and he said, 
Brother Monson, there's a widow in your ward, and her name is Margaret Bird, and she lives in a trailer house, and she's very lonely and depressed, and I want you to go over there and visit and make her feel welcome. Uh, he left the 99 to tend to the needs of the one. And also, we have um, Carol B. Lee, who uh, went and left his uh, post, more or less, who tend to the needs of two sisters who were very depressed and felt uh, all alone and uh, lonely, and uh, there were two widows, and he called them to the church job and service in the temple and let them know they felt important, and they became happy and fruitful, and, uh, and their life became full again, and they weren't depressed. Uh, um... The Lord uh, has empathy for us. He uh, He has perfect empathy for us. He has, on the cross, and especially in Gethsemane, though, He suffered every feeling of pain or guilt or remorse that we have ever felt. He has 100% empathy. And He has uh, 100% of the feelings that we have ever had. And he carried them, not only just the, uh, how the burdens for our sins, but these others of mental anguish and, and these other things. He knows what we're talking about. And from his point of view, he can say, I know what you're feeling. I understand you. And he is, he is to- totally empathetic uh, to us. Oh, his last uh, three concerns when he was on the cross was for his mother. And I mean, here he was hanging on the cross. He wanted her to be cared for. And he wanted to care for the thief. You know, he gave him hope. And um, and yet he never, even though in his pain, he never did let go of the goal and the, or the um, job that he was to do. He, even though he said, if thou wilt, let this cut me past from me, he never... And he said, nevertheless, I will not mind be done. And uh, uh, he never lost sight of what he was supposed to be doing. Uh, the other thing that I want to say is that uh, the Savior wishes to send us peace. He, uh, he said, peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you. Not as the world giveth, give I unto you. But he he answers our prayers and our questions, and he can uh, happen in and get brings us happiness. Happiness is not a uh, a circumstance; it's the feeling of inner peace that we can have. Story is told of um, a, a young missionary who was stricken with polio many years ago, and he was in the room with his uh, another man who was, had been a successful businessman and he said if you could have one wish what it would be and he said uh, before I met you basically I would have wished for complete health he said but now I wish for the sweet peace that you have and the assurance that you have that your heavenly father loves you and uh, it, so it matters not what our circumstances are it matters how uh, um, much peace we have and inner peace we have from living the gospel and from enjoying the love that the Savior has and taking advantage of that. Uh, it's my testimony that he does hear and answer our prayers and answer some of the whys, gives us some uh, strength to go on with our child. Our lives were not meant uh, to be a rose garden. That's not the uh, purpose of this life. Our purpose is to grow by our trials and tribulations and to uh, grow uncomplainingly and uh, uh, and for him to support us and our Heavenly Father and Jesus Christ will support us as we face these trials no matter what they be. I remember Irene Hilton said it's not so much uh, when she was talking to me about Jan she said it wasn't so much dealing with the problem of returned child like that and deciding what to do and uh, and how to handle it and so that's the way I said, well, the many trials that we have, uh, the real hard part sometimes is deciding how to accept our trials and tribulations and how to handle them. 
Um, but the Lord does answer our questions and uh, gives us some peace and uh, in our heart and gives us strength to go on. There's a story related in one of the instances, I think, this issue in April, about a man who had a Down syndrome little uh, daughter, and he asked why, and uh, trying to wrestle with this and the problems facing uh, him and his wife. He said, and then his mind, he said, it wasn't a vision or anything, but just a scenario, you know, presented itself like a... Um, a story, and he was uh, he, he presumed or fantasized himself in the um, the um, in heaven, the preexistence, and um, they were told that someone would come to the earth, you know, with a handicap and to teach the others. And, and they looked around, and it was his little daughter that volunteered, said, "I'll go," and I volunteered for it. And he said that. Uh, but whether that happened or not wasn't important, but it did teach him, and the truth was revealed to him, the great love and the great spirit that this little child was, and it helped him and it gave him peace of mind as he uh, faced his challenges. Um, another thing that I'd like to talk about um is how the Lord loves us and He wants uh, us to listen to Him and He wants to communicate with us. And sometimes we <coughs> draw away from Him. And uh, I found out something that just really helps me as I study the Scriptures. And that is to put my name in there, every, insert my name every time I can. For example, you could say, For God so loved the world, Sarah, that um, that you should not perish, but have everlasting life. And for God uh, sent not his son into the world to condemn Sarah, but that you might be saved. It becomes very, very personal as you read the scriptures and insert your name. Uh, I was reading in King Benjamin's script and it became very personal to me when he was telling us about the beggars. And it said, For behold, are we not all beggars? Do we not all depend on the same being, even God, for all the substance we, we have, Sarah? For both food and raiment, and for gold and silver, for all riches of every kind, Sarah? And behold, even as this time have been a calling on his name, Sarah, and begging for remission of sins. And has he suffered, Sarah, that ye have begged in vain? No, Sarah, he has poured out his spirit upon you. But, so if we insert our name in there, it becomes very personal. And one of the most, uh, the easy, one of the easiest ways that our Lord can communicate with us is by giving us inspiration through the scriptures. Bruce McConkie says, by far, by far, by far, the most, um, the easiest way that I receive revelation from our Heavenly Father is from studying the Scriptures. And it becomes those very personalized Scriptures where we know that um, the Book of Mormon was written for our day to us and for us. <coughs> the things in are by prophets who saw our day and knew what our needs would be. And that's why there's, why do you think there's so much stuff about pride and vanity and worldliness? And it's because this is for our day. Let's insert our name and become conscious of the Savior and receive the inspiration and communication that He has for us. In conclusion, I'd like to bear my testimony that I know that this church is. God's true church on the face of the earth. It's His complete church. And if we are obedient to the principles, uh, we will receive peace in our hearts. We will listen to the Lord and we will feel His love. And I say this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.
afternoon, brothers and sisters. Um, my wife and I have been asked to speak to you on this Easter Sunday. This is the day in which we commemorate the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It's the, it was the first occasion in the history of the world for an individual to be resurrected. That is, for his earthly tabernacle to actually survive death. In other words, to return to life. Um, to people who had not been taught this principle, it was unbelievable. And to uh, Christians today, if they think about it very much, it's still very difficult to understand. It's absolutely fantastic that it happened, and more so that it opened the door for the rest of us to experience that great phenomenon. Whether it be a blessing or a curse, it is the resurrection, as the scriptures say, some unto salvation and some unto damnation. But it was apparently 1993 years ago today that that great event took place. I didn't know my wife was going to use this scripture. It is found in John chapter 3, and I began my message with it. <clears throat> For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Sister Pastor and I spent considerable time discussing Christ, his immense love for us, and what he did for us, including on the cross on Golgotha, and more particularly the scene at Gethsemane. And the more we discuss Gethsemane, his immense love for us and his agony and suffering, the more each of us realize that we cannot understand that. And especially I pointed out to my wife that I can't understand. I, I don't know what that means. That he suffered for the sins of the scores of billions of people who have lived and died and what that suffering entails. As we read where he bled from every pore of the body and I have a hard time understanding that. I have never bled from a single pore of the body unless my skin was broken or bruised. And so what kind of pain does it take to to cause that phenomenon. And what does it mean that that accounted, covered the sins of, the, of all mankind? I guess it includes all mankind because all mankind, save it be a few that become sons of perdition, at least it includes all mankind except those few that become sons of perdition because um, there is nobody that can enter into the kingdom of heaven, any degree of the kingdom of heaven, lest they repent. Because no unclean thing can enter into the kingdom of heaven. And the scriptures clearly state that every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess. Um, sadly, much of the repentance will be late from paradise or the spiritual world. But still, his suffering covered all. So we began to search the scriptures together and Sister Packard found uh, in the commentary to the New Testament, uh, she shared with me and passed it to me some comments by Elder Bruce R. McConkey, one of our late apostles who is, is a church historian. And I discovered that I wasn't alone in not understanding that took place in Gethsemane. Elder McConkie states, Christ's agony in the garden is unfathomable 
by the finite mind, both as to intensity and cause. He struggled and groaned under a burden such as no other being who has lived on the earth might even conceive as possible. It was not physical pain nor mental anguish alone that caused him to suffer such torture as to produce an extrusion of blood from every pore, but a spiritual agony of soul such as only God was capable of experiencing. No other man, however great his powers of physical or mental endurance, could have suffered so. For his human organism would have succumbed to unconsciousness and welcomed oblivion or death. In some manner, actual and terribly real, though to man incomprehensible, the Savior took upon himself the burden of the sins of mankind from Adam to the end of the world. From the terrible conflict in Gethsemane, Christ emerged a victor. Well, we don't have to understand it. And, but we are expected by faith to appreciate it and to do everything that we're supposed to do to benefit from it. I turn to the Doctrine and Covenant. Those of you who have been to the Liberty Jail up in Missouri, it's different today than it was back in 1830. <coughs> Our family visited it just a few months ago, and the ceiling is a little higher now than it was in actual times in 1830. At that time, a grown man could not walk upright. He had to crouch over a little bit if he was six foot one or so. And Joseph Smith and some close friends were imprisoned in this essentially a dungeon for six months in the cold winter. And the floor was uneven stones. It wasn't smooth. It was damp. They were fed unhealthy, sometimes even poisonous food. He was an absolute misery. During this time, the prophet uttered one of his greatest prayers to the Lord. O oh God, where art thou? Where is the pavilion that uh, covereth thy hiding place? How long shall thy hand be stayed, and thine eye, yea, thine pure eye, behold from the eternal heavens the wrongs of thy people and of thy servants, and thine ear be penetrated with their cries? Yea, O Lord, how long shall they suffer these wrongs and unlawful oppressions? You see, the saints were being mobbed and persecuted there in Independence, Missouri. They were being driven. Their homes were being burned. Their children were being uh, harmed and abused. And their wives were being assaulted. And Joseph Smith, the prophet, this great modern-day, latter-day prophet, was in prison. And he's pleading to the Lord, Remember thy suffering saints, O our God, and thy servants will rejoice in thy name forever. And then the Savior speaks. And he, then he reveals one of the very greatest revelations or sections in the Doctrine and Covenants. Behold, there are many called, but few are chosen. How long can rolling waters remain impure? No power or influence can or ought to be maintained by virtue of the priesthood only by persuasion, by long suffering. Joseph Smith could never have written that without inspiration from God. But the scriptures that I have to share with you, the Savior speaks, My son, peace be unto thy soul. Thine adversity and thine affliction shall be but a small moment. And then if thou endure it well, God shall exalt thee on high. Thou shalt triumph all thy, over all thy foes. Then he goes on to say he does in the very next section and says to the prophet Joseph, if thou art called to pass through tribulation, <coughs> and it's a comparison, he's comparing, comparing Joseph with Job, the great prophet, who apparently suffered more than any mortal soul has ever suffered in this life, in this world, save it be Jesus Christ, who is uh, semi-mortal. <laughs> And then he compares it to Joseph Smith. If thou art called to pass through tribulation, if thou art in perils among false brethren, if thou art in perils among robbers, and if thou art in perils by land or by sea, if thou art accused with all manner of false accusations, if thine enemies fall upon thee, 
if they tear thee from the bosom and society of thy mother and father, and then it goes on about being torn from his wife and from his little son, and if thou shouldest be cast into the pit or into the hands of murderers, and the sentence of death passed upon thee because it was passed upon him, Jesus Christ, by people that were supposed to have appreciated him, by the Sanhedrin that is, or to say it in our language, by the quorum of the twelve apostles of the day. Not Christ's quorum, but the apostles, the leading church brethren of the day, not only persecuted Christ, but sentenced him to death. Then the Savior, in speaking to Joseph, goes beyond the mortal punishment and into the realm of the adversary, that is, persecution from Lucifer himself. If thou be cast into the deep, if the billowing surge conspire against thee, if fierce winds become thine enemy, if the heavens gather blackness and all the elements combine to hedge up the way, brother Joseph, the prophet, and above all, if the very jaws of hell shall gape open the mouth wide after thee, and I guess that happened to our Savior. Know thou, my son, that all these things shall give thee experience and shall be for thy good. The Son of Man, Jesus himself, hath descended below them all. Art thou greater than he? And for you and myself now, because my time is about up, so this is for us, hoping to, that we will appreciate his great suffering. Therefore, this is from the Savior, section 19, verse 15 on, Therefore I command you to repent. Repent, lest I smite you by the rod of my mouth, and by my wrath, and by my anger, and your sufferings be sore. How sore you know not, how exquisite you know not, yea, how hard to bear you know not. For behold, and this is a beautiful scripture, behold, I, God, have suffered these things for all, that they might not suffer if they would repent. Can you imagine that? He's not talking about he suffered for his friends or for those that spoke well of him, for his relatives. He suffered, and I, I don't have time to share with you a personal experience I was considering, where somebody offended me and stole money from me and everything. He suffered for these people that were cruel to him, so that they wouldn't have to suffer. That's the ultimate love. Not speaking of friends, relatives, those who have scratched his back. He's speaking of those who cursed and abused and spat upon him and lied against him. And it's different than the suffering of regular prophets, uh, regular prophets, other prophets have gone through, because this was a case where he had power and control and authority over the situation. That is, he could have stopped the torment. He was their God, their creator. In every sense of the word, their creator. But he allowed it to go on for their good, because he loved them, no matter how they felt about him. But if they would not, speaking of you and me, Bernie, if you will not repent, then you, Bernie, must suffer, even as I. If suffering caused myself, even God, the greatest of all, to tremble because of pain, and to bleed at every pore, and to suffer both body and spirit, and would that I might not drink the bitter cup and shrink. I close with this part of the Lord's Prayer in Matthew chapter 6. <clears throat> to me, it's an awesome scripture. And it's frightening, but it's comforting and beautiful. And I've chosen this for my sake and for my benefit. I certainly have no hidden agenda preaching at anybody else. This is for me. After this manner, therefore, pray ye, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. This is right in the Beatitudes Sermon on the Mount. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. 
the inspired version right here would say, instead of lead us not into temptation, it says, and suffer us that we not be led into temptation. But only key part, which is slightly different than this, but it's, it's okay. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. The inspired version says, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. That's a quote. Then the pair ends. <clears throat> then two verses. And then the Savior goes on to another completely unrelated subject about fasting. But for two verses, he amplified, he elaborated on his great prayer, the Lord's Prayer. And those two verses speak of only one point in the Lord's Prayer. And that is, and forgive us our debts or our trespasses as we forgive others their trespasses. It's, it's absolutely beautiful and awesome. Forgive us as we forgive others. We're damned if we don't and we're saved if we do. <clears> There's <throat> two verses right after his prayer. For if we forgive men their trespasses, and this does say trespasses, your Heavenly Father will also forgive you. That's the beauty. That's what makes this about the most beautiful scripture in all the Bible. And that the awesome scripture is, but if you forget, forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. And so I'm trying. And for the rest of my life, I will try because I have so many shortcomings. But if I can accomplish that one, I'll have a chance. And I pray for all of us in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.